Happy Monday, everyone. It is Glenn Kyle here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. So excited to start another week with you with our great digital programming. We're going to have fun. Hopefully, you're going to have fun and learn a lot of things. So, today is Ask a Historian, so we're going to open it up for questions. If any of you just uh, have something that pops in your head that you always wanted to know, or if you want to top those questions out, or kids learning at home with your uh, school from home, if you've got questions you maybe need some clarification on, please go ahead and send me those and I will do the best that I can to answer them. So we have a couple of questions we've gotten already. One of them is, you know, why is Thomas Jefferson considered one of the... I, did I say Thomas Jefferson? Yeah, Thomas Edison. <laughs> Thomas Edison. You can tell this brain, crazy, full of history. Why is Thomas Edison considered one of the greatest inventors of all time? Well, it's because really there are about 1,500 patents in the U.S. Patent Office under his name. Did he actually create all those inventions on his own? No, he did not. He was a very uh, bright young lad, and, and as a young man, he had an incredible curiosity and a great scientific knowledge, and, and really he had one of the great things that is required of any great inventor. He liked to tinker. He liked to work with things. He liked to make machines, take machines apart, put them back together in ways that made them more effective and more efficient. So that drove a lot of the things. So some of the things that he invented, that first, of course, we think of him for the light bulb, uh, which, when you stop and think about it, is probably one of the most significant inventions that still affect us today. I mean, I bet most of you are sitting somewhere. You may even be illuminated by artificial lighting now. You're certainly going to turn on that light switch uh, when it starts to get dark outside. Uh, artificial lights and illumination are all around us. But before that, he had invented some different types of, of telegraph. Remember, this was the main means of communication. He had uh, worked with some of the phonographs, ways to record sound and have it played back so that it could be played back over and over. Again, you have to remember, before Edison came up with the methods to do this, we couldn't record sound. We have no idea how things really, truly sounded before about 1900. It's, it's kind of a lost part of history that most of us don't consider. But eventually, he became so successful, he began to sell some of his inventions, and he realized that maybe there's a, a better and more efficient and more a profitable way to go about this. So he began to hire other people to come in at a place called Menlo Park. This was a place in New Jersey that he developed as a laboratory. And he would have these people come in and work on different experiments with telegraphy and electricity and phonographic recording and light bulbs and, and, and better, more efficient means to send electric current, things like that. So eventually he became more of a an overseer, sort of a manager of the laboratory, rather than a tinkerer himself. So because of those people working for him, since it was his business, whenever they invented something or discovered something, he was the one. His business under his name was able to apply for those patents. That's one reason he has so many patents. But that shouldn't discount the remarkable innovation that he himself had. And if someone had also asked, was he uh, what caused him to go deaf? If, if memory serves, I think it was congenital. I think it was a condition that he was born with and perhaps got worse during his childhood. He was deaf, as the, it sounds like a joke, he was deaf in one ear and couldn't hear very well out of the other. But sometimes he sort of considered this a very positive thing because it kept him from having to take part in long conversations that he was not interested in. He would rather be at work. So that's, that's Thomas Edison. Another question I've gotten which has some relevance in today's world with uh, governors and, and presidents giving certain orders that some people may feel can curtail their civil rights. And this is a, something that has been around since the history of civil rights and since we began to appreciate that we all had individual rights. And the specific question was, did Abraham Lincoln suspend civil rights during the Civil War and, and why and how? So that's a, that's a good question. Uh, there is a concept in law, in, in American law and British law too, called habeas corpus, which is Latin for produce the body. But what it really means is, is that you can't be arrested or detained by the government, whether it's federal, state, or local. You can't be arrested and held for no reason. They have to actually charge you with something. They have to actually uh, have arrested you and seized you for a specific purpose. They just can't say, well, I think you might be up to something. 
has to be for a concrete reason. So that's habeas corpus. And this is a very important part of American law because it keeps people from just being arrested left and right and put in jail on the whims of a government official. But the U.S. Constitution does say that in time of war or insurrection that the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended. So it's very specific. It says only in time of war, only or insurrection. That means a rebellion. That is certainly what was going on uh, during Abraham Lincoln's early presidency. And the problem he was facing is the border state of Maryland, which of course borders the national capital of Washington, D.C., there was some fear that it would secede and go to the Southern Confederacy. And he had to make sure that this was not going to happen. He had to stop those who were agitating and were perhaps going to use violence to force Maryland into the southern states. So he did issue a writ suspending habeas corpus just for the state of Maryland and arrested a lot of people that he thought might be involved in trying to do that. Now, Congress immediately has an uproar and says, this is not your power as president. This is only something that can be done with Congress. And so to make a long, interesting story short, for the rest of the war, there were a series of different congressional acts and a series of different uh, judicial findings, including several Supreme Court findings, that went back and forth about when the president, when Congress could suspend habeas corpus and how. But suffice to say that by the middle of the war, they had sort of reached an agreement that it was a legitimate course of action to preserve the safety of the people and of the Union. And by the end of the Civil War, uh, that suspension had happened. It actually also happened under uh, George Bush during, uh, shortly after the 9-11 attacks in the United States. That was considered a time of war, uh, even though war had not been officially declared. And of course, another huge amount of court cases popped up. We won't go into those, but, but suffice to say, there is historic precedent for doing something like that. There is certainly judicial precedents for doing something like that, but that's one of the really amazing and flexible aspects of our constitutional system is it's able to wrestle with these questions and allow a dialogue. And so it's important to point out that even though these were issues that could severely curtail individual freedoms and could severely divide people on where they would come down, they settled and we continue to tend to settle these things through a peaceful legal process not through violence, not through rebellions, things like that. That's important. That's one of the great flexible parts of the U.S. Constitution. So those are the two questions I had to start off with. But Libba, what else do we have? What, what else are folks, folks asking? Well, Leslie wants to know, who discovered England? Oh, that's an interesting question. The question is, who discovered England? Um, so the English uh, Isle, well, the, the Isle of Great Britain, as it's called now, has been inhabited by humans for several, several, several thousand years. So I'm not sure you could say that someone discovered it because to discover something means that a person goes into an unknown thing, finds it, and then reports back to, it, uh, to their friends, to their government, to their people that they have found this new thing. Early on when people began to settle in England, or what's now England, they weren't really looking to discover things. They were looking for places to live, for farm, to farm. I'm t I'm, this is almost caveman times. This is Neanderthal or maybe just immediately post-Neanderthal, uh, post-Lithic era. And at the time where the English Channel is now, best we can tell is that was a land bridge. The water had receded from that area. So what's now the, the British Isles was actually physically connected to the mainland of Europe. And so people as part of the migrations were able to cross that and go into those areas and continue to farm uh, and continue to live. And as, as the ages went by, then the water began to rise, the ocean levels filled up the English Channel and sort of separated England from that point. And from that point on, England, uh, as today, remains an island. And it certainly means that the culture in that area is certainly uh, more it's very unique, let's say. They, have, they certainly have their own way of seeing and doing things. Uh, how many women were in the American Revolution? Ah, so the question is, how many women were in the American Revolution? That's, that's sort of a tough question to answer. Let me take it from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, one answer could be all of them. 
if you were a woman in one of the 13 colonies and the war is going on, the war for independence, there's every possibility that the war could wind up on your doorstep or in your farm or something like that and you have to deal with that. Your husband or your brothers or your fathers may be in the armies fighting and that would leave you at home. Uh, you may be an enslaved woman, uh, one of the African Americans who is held in bondage on one of the southern plantations. And of course, that's going to limit how you see things. It may also give you the opportunity, we've discussed before, about some of the ways the British were trying to pull the enslaved away from those rebelling against the king and sort of make them be on the, on the British side, on the crown side. So the American Revolution and the, the war for independence that followed really touched almost every person who was alive in the colonies at that time, including women, and it posed its own set of challenges. Now, if you're talking about how many women participated in the ideological revolution that was the American Revolution, uh, probably not very many. Not very many, or I could say no one directly. That's not the realm that women participated in. Women at that time did not actively and openly participate in government and in, in things like that. Now, they might have had some influence through their husbands, and, and that varied from a man who's basically just going to use his wife as a, as a tool on the farm to cook and clean and have kids, all the way up to one of my personal favorites, John Adams. And John Adams and his wife, Abigail, were truly a couple. They were, they were probably America's first couple, if you want to call them that. They were intellectual equals. They adored each other. They had conversations. And she supported what he was doing, but she also wasn't afraid to sort of call him when she saw him and, and his revolutionary friends doing something that might seem uh, not, in fa not, not necessarily for the benefit of everyone involved. She wrote him one letter that, that implored him when they were talking about the independence of America and allowing each common man a say in government. She wrote the famous letter that says, Remember the ladies, John, for there are as many of us as there are of you, and we, just like you, perhaps we should rebel for our native and civil rights. So it varied how women were going to be involved, but there's no question that women were involved and that it touched their lives uh, throughout the colonies. When did people start domesticating dogs and cats? Oh, that's a tough one. When did people start domesticating dogs and cats? Uh, well, you, you've, you're asking an informed question because you do know, based on the question, that dogs and cats used to be wild critters, and then at some point in, human, in the human past, we took them and sort of petted them and started feeding them, and they became domesticated. They became part of... Uh, part of our lives. And it wasn't just dogs and cats, of course. It was all the livestock that we have, cows and chickens and pigs and horses and things like that. But your question specifically was about dogs and cats. We think, we're not sure because, of course, there are no written records. We depend totally almost on archaeology. But we think dogs were probably the first domesticated animal, and that probably started happening literally back in the Neanderthal days, in the caveman days. Um, with the, because, of course, dogs are more or less descended from wolves, and we would bring some of those wolves in. Uh, dogs are very handy at early warning. If something uh, bad is approaching your, your family or where you live, they can help you hunt. They can help you hunt food. They can protect you if you're attacked. And, of course, I don't know how common this was in the Neanderthal days, but they can also curl up in your lap or at your feet and get petted and be very good boys. Uh, similar to the, to the way cats work. I'm not sure that humans have ever domesticated cats. I think cats may have domesticated us, uh, having three at my house as it is. But, but those cats are going to be drawn to uh, the types of things they can hunt, especially like rats and things. They're going to be where humans store their food. So as humans began to store their food in large stockpiles, those large stockpiles would draw in the vermin that would want to take that, and cats would naturally follow those. And I think eventually, much like with dogs, when you set out a little bit of food for the cat, that cat is going to stay in your area and is going to take care of all those rats and squirrels and things that might want to steal your food. But, but uh, cats, and especially dogs, are some of the oldest uh, friends that we humans have. Caitlin wants to know, are Franklin D. Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt related? 
Uh, so the question is, are uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt related? Uh, the answer is yes. So uh, Theodore Roosevelt was older. Uh, he was one of the early presidents. He was a, a statesman. He was the governor of New York. He was a, 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 he was lieutenant colonel of the Rough Riders, the U.S. Volunteers in the Spanish-American War. And um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came a generation later. Uh, he was also involved in New York politics, but eventually became our longest serving president. He served for four terms. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was Theodore Roosevelt's nephew. Uh, so Theodore Roosevelt's brother, uh, or actually I think it might have been his sister, had a son, and that was Franklin. All right. So George Washington was often away from home. Do you know, or what is the longest time he was away from Martha? Sure. So the question is, uh, during the American Revolution, and even perhaps before that, when he was doing the, the French and Indian War things, George Washington was away from home for a long time, taking care of, of the armies, taking care of exploration in the early days, surveying, and of course when he was president. And the question really comes to, how long was he away and uh, from, from home at Mount Vernon, and how, what was the longest time that he did not get to see Martha? So from the time he left... Um, Mount Vernon, his home in Virginia, uh, right around the time of the Second Continental Congress when he took command of the Continental Army around Boston in 1775, he did not go back home. He did not go to Mount Vernon, if, if I'm remembering correctly, until the uh, campaign for Yorktown, which is uh, 1781. So what is that? That's five, that's almost six years that Washington did not go home, didn't, didn't go see his home. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't see Martha for that long because, of course, you know, Martha's, uh, she's a person. She's portable. She can move around. And, and George Washington often would ask Martha to come and join him when the whenever the army went into winter camp. And so she was there uh, with him for a short time, at least, at, at Valley Forge uh, and at most of the other winter camps along the, the course of the Continental Army's uh, Revolutionary War. She would come and see him during the winter months. So, but that's still going to leave, you know, six or seven months during the year when he's not going to see her and she's not going to see him at all. And it's, and it's very interesting. They, I, I spoke about John Adams and, and Abigail. Uh, they have left us a plethora of letters that they wrote to each other and they really give such a wonderful insight into that relationship and the humanity and the love that sort of revolved around them. George Washington and Martha did not want anyone, especially future generations, to know that much about their private life. And so we, unfortunately, have practically no letters whatsoever, personal letters, between Martha and George. Uh, they destroyed them. They, just, they, they burned them. There's nothing left. I think we have found one that accidentally slid down inside a chest of drawers from where it was uh, accidentally allowed to survive, and that's like the one personal letter we have between them. But, but they, they were close as, as far as we can tell, but, um, but I'm, you know, George had other things on his mind when the war was going on and wasn't always thinking about having Martha near him unless it was sort of a convenient downtime during the winter. Uh, Regina Dyer <laughs> says, I think General Longstreet's Piedmont Hotel is the birthplace of fried chicken for you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Regina wants to know if the Piedmont Hotel here in Gainesville, Georgia is the birthplace of fried chicken. Um, that is something that we have uh, frequently said here in Gainesville. For those of you around the country, it's important that you know that Gainesville considers itself the poultry capital of the world. We have uh, more chicken houses and we raise more poultry in terms of poundage and numbers than any other place in the entire country, and we have really since the 50s, so we're very, very proud of our poultry heritage. And, and the Piedmont Hotel was a business that General James Longstreet of the Confederacy uh, built here after the Civil War. So he comes to Gainesville to live, and the war is over. He wants to be a businessman, and so he develops this hotel. And the hotel is only a short walk from the rail line, which is an incredibly important rail line in this part of Georgia. It's the main rail line in this part of Georgia. And so uh, a little later, and he, so he began to offer fried chicken as a dish. And of course, that was very popular. And so the, the question is, 
did Gainesville, was, is Gainesville officially the first home of fried chicken? It is hard to say that. Uh, it may be the first place where fried chicken was advertised as a specific delicious meal that you should come here and get. But of course, people have been frying food and, and frying chickens for a long, long time. And it's, and it's uh, not an unknown way to prepare the dish. So I don't know that we can say that we are the birthplace of fried chicken, but we are certainly the home of fried chicken. <laughs> Brittany is curious about the first pioneers in Tennessee, or can you talk about pioneers in general? Well, that, okay, so that, uh, that was Brittany? Yes. Brittany, that is, that is a big question. Let me see if I can kind of narrow it down a little bit. So, you're, so Brittany's question was about frontiersmen and pioneers in Tennessee specifically, but just even in a larger, when did they come in, why did they come in, and how? So I've got some really good friends in Tennessee, uh, but I never cease to remind them that Tennessee is not one of the original 13 colonies. For a long, long time, it was, in effect, just an extension of North Carolina. Uh, so, but there were still a lot of frontiersmen and pioneers because in the early days of America and the colonies, and even after we gained our independence as the United States, the great promise for every person or family in the new world was the availability of land. And you could, and this was something that simply was not remotely possible in Europe and in the old world. All the land was taken up. And if you wanted to find your own way, you either had to work for someone else on their land or get a trade or something like that. You could not get your own land. If you could, it was so expensive, it was beyond the cost of most ordinary people. But if you came to the new world, there was land here, as, as Thomas Jefferson said, for the hundredth and the thousandth generation. And so continuing to extend those boundaries and to continue to expand and open up those lands where Native Americans live, that's, a, that's certainly an issue that, to take into account. But, but going into Tennessee, uh, it becomes an area where people have to, they're hardy people. They're going into a place where there are no, there's no infrastructure, there's no roads, there's no post offices. They're just going to literally carve a living out of the wilderness. And so that takes a certain type of person, and those pioneers, as we call them, certainly have that spirit. They're individualistic. They want to make their own way. They want to get as far away from the what they would consider the oppressiveness of regulation and civilization as possible to, to make their own way. That also creates an economic stability that will allow them to perhaps grow their holdings um, and continue to prosper and farm more land. This might lead to them becoming plantation owners and, and purchasing slaves so that they can really make the use, make the most use of the land that is available to them. But that pioneering spirit really continues from the earliest days of settlement of America until, oh, about, say, maybe the 1880s or 90s. Uh, and this is something that, that the United States and, and some famous historians have really wrestled with because for, what is that, 16, so for about two and a half, three hundred, Two and a half, three hundred 300 years, the entire spirit of America, the thing that's defined who we are, is this pioneer process, this going into the wilderness, opening it up, settling, creating a, a family farm, creating that land. That's been the literally the American dream. And we continue to expand and expand and expand and do that. Uh, we go through wars to do it. We remove Indians to do it. And suddenly, by the time you get to the 1880s and 90s, we're to the Pacific Ocean. There is no more frontier on the continental United States. And that is the first time in American history that happens. And it really starts to shape and change the way America views itself. A fellow named Frederick Jackson Turner, a famous historian, sort of had this, this theory. He's like, well, once there is no more frontier, this thing that has defined America since its beginning then how do we define ourselves? How do Americans define themselves? And one of the things he said was, well, even though there's no more frontier, the spirit of those pioneers and those frontiersmen is going to continue to be a core part of our national identity. And I think he's right. Uh, even today, we all imagine the, the lone you know, frontiersman walking out into the wilderness, maybe taking his family, uh, incredibly individualistic, incredibly self-sufficient, brave, 
And that's just something that we always think of when we think of America. Nolan wants to know why it was Pearl Harbor like specifically the location that was attacked. Okay. So yeah, so the question is why was uh, Pearl Harbor specifically the location that the Japanese attacked on December 7th? Now, the Japanese attacked several different places on December 7th or December 8th, depending upon exactly where the time daytime falls. But it was a coordinated attack by the Japanese. They attacked Guam. They attacked uh, Wake Island. They attacked several of the United States' smaller islands. The Philippines. They attacked the Philippines. But the reason they attacked Pearl Harbor is because that was the home of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Now, the Pacific Ocean is an ocean, right? It's a gigantic body of water. And big nations like the United States and like Japan have to have big navies, warships, modern warships to patrol that big ocean and have an influence on it. But those warships, they have to have fuel, they have to be resupplied, they have to have a home port. And basically, Pearl Harbor had become the home port for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Most of its big ships were there, the big battleships, the, the destroyers, the cruisers, uh, and even the Army had set up an air base there for its, uh, at the time, brand new B-17 bombers. So it was a very important military target. And the Japanese, what they were trying to do, one of the reasons they attacked on a Sunday, on a Sunday morning, is so that most of the ships would be in the harbor, they would not be manned, they would just be sitting there and wouldn't be able to resist attack because they wanted to get as many of the U.S. ships in one place as they could and attack that and therefore destroy as many ships as they could because if you can destroy not all, of course, was the goal, but even a large proportion of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, then the Japanese Pacific Fleet is going to be able to go where it wants without having to fight the Americans. So that attack on Pearl Harbor becomes the absolute focal point of the operation. But one thing the Japanese tried to do that they were not able to get was the aircraft carriers. The United States and some other countries were sort of slow in coming on to how important aircraft carriers were going to be in naval warfare. Um, but the Japanese knew and they wanted to, to sink those American carriers. They couldn't do it. Now, this Wednesday, we're actually going to have an entire live stream on the U.S. Navy in World War II, and of course we're going to be looking a lot at the Pacific Theater and a lot of those uh, uh, sailors and their jobs and, and their equipment. So please tune in for that. We'll probably be able to go into that in a little bit more detail on Wednesday. All right. Kathy wants to know, who came up with the idea of a president? <laughs> so the question is, who came up with the idea of a president? That's a, that's a good question. Let me, let me think about that for a second. I don't know that I can tell you exactly who it was. I can tell you why it was. Uh, since ancient days, uh, most of human history, humans have looked for uh, communal and societal direction from leaders, usually from one specific leader. And only rarely in our past have we had different systems that take into account the will of many people, like the Athenian democracy, even though that was far from perfect and far from universal, most of human past has concentrated power in the hands of one person or a very small group of people. And very often that has become hereditary. By that I mean that you have the ruler and then the ruler has a son and then the son automatically becomes the ruler. And then that person has a son and that son automatically becomes the ruler. If you're lucky, that can make for good leadership, but it's not a guarantee. So people began to realize that, number one, things sometimes work better if you have one person in charge of things. There's one direction, there's one vision, there's one set of, of brains making the decisions, but you might want to change that out. So the idea of rather than having it be hereditary, someone you elect, someone that other people can choose that doesn't necessarily go from father to son, from father to son. That's the idea behind a presidency. It is a leader that is chosen by the people or by the, the small group of, of aristocrats in charge, but it's someone who is chosen 
to lead based on their merits rather than just simply being born into it. So that's how the idea of a president came about. All right. Can you talk about the, the history of the automobile and the, the transitional time from wagons, I guess? Oh, sure. So the question is, you know, can, can you just touch on the history of the automobile and the transition from horse-drawn stuff to engine-driven stuff? Number one, uh, this happened in the very early 19th, excuse me, early 20th century. Uh, you could say in like the first, uh, probably 1910-ish, 1920 is when that really began to take off. But it's also important to remember that it was not a switch that someone threw. Uh, it was a very, very slow transition, okay? Um, at first, cars were very expensive and very primitive. Um, some of them were basically just wagons with an engine in front that would move the wheels instead of being pulled by horses. They were that primitive. As time went by, they began to get a little more complicated, but they continued to be out of the reach of the average person, the average consumer. And so most people are still using animal-powered transportation, whether they're riding the horse or pulling the wagon or what have you. This is why Henry Ford becomes so important, because it's his business model that says, I'm going to create cars that everyone can afford. I'm going to make them fast, I'm going to make them all the same, and I'm going to make them uh, affordable and make it so that people can borrow money to get them or just buy them outright. And so the cost of a car under Henry Ford, the Ford Motor Company, goes down so fast that more and more people are able to purchase them. They become a, a common item. Now, as they become more common though, we have to put in place things that help the cars go. We, we don't even think about these today. Paved roads, service stations, gas stations. We, you know, in America, we have a gas station about every 20 feet. Uh, but in the early days, those gas stations, you sort of had to plan because they weren't everywhere and the roads weren't paved. And as the infrastructure, the things that supported the automobile continued to grow and continued to grow, more and more people got cars. The big, big boost, though, came after World War II because American industry had begun building all these vehicles for the war. Tanks and trucks and planes and things like that. Well, after the war, they wanted to keep those businesses going. So instead of making tanks and trucks and planes and Jeeps, they began to make cars for people and they began to make credit for people so that they could buy the cars. And then they began to pave the roads everywhere, right? If you are on an, an interstate system, the interstate system began with Eisenhower when he was elected president because he understood the importance of a good road system. So as time has gone on, the government has created great infrastructure. We can drive, that's the great, well, if there wasn't a quarantine on, we could drive any, almost anywhere in this country from one point to the other. Literally, almost any point in the country, someone's house to another house, a historic site, a business, we can go anywhere with our car. Now, that has raised a new set of issues as, we, as more and more people have gotten cars, as we've become more and more dependent upon fuel for the cars, where's it going to come from, what are the impacts to the environment, things like that. So it's a really, really interesting history and it's tied into American history in the way that it's not really tied into to really any other uh, first world country's history because the automobile and America sort of developed at the same time. We were relatively young, so those two went hand in hand and developed together, unlike in European countries that had been around for a lot longer but hadn't developed with motor-driven vehicles. All right, Rebecca is doing her own research and wants to know, what's the best way to research the introduction of the telephone's impact on a specific community in the 1910s? Ah, <laughs> okay. So uh, the question is, what's the best way to research the impact of a telephone on a community in the 1910s. Um, hmm. Probably, here's one of the things I would do. If you can, it, it depends on the community, right? Are you talking about a small or a big town? You can, the things I'm about to say you can use for both, but they may be easier with a bigger town. Go to the newspapers. Go to the newspapers um, in the 19 aughts and then go to the newspapers in the 1910s 
and look at the ads for businesses. This is one way. And see if those businesses start adding telephone numbers in their ads. And you can see how many businesses start adopting telephone communications. Uh, you can do the same thing with, with one ads. You can see, you know, come to the store to apply for a job or call this number. If you're really lucky and if the, 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 the town or towns you're talking about publish directories, um, you know, they weren't always phone directories. Sometimes they were just addresses, but eventually they started adding telephone numbers to those directories as well. Um, you younger kids, you may not very often see a phone book, but phone books were totally huge back in the day and they really only started being a, a major part of how we communicated with each other probably about 10 years ago. But those city directories or those city telephone books can be a great source. They may seem dull, but you'll be able to see over time uh, how much bigger they got, uh, how the numbers change. As more people get phone numbers, the, the actual numbers themselves are going to have to get longer and longer to accommodate more and more customers. So there's a couple of different ways you can do some, some primary source research to look at the expansion of those telephones and how they start to change businesses. Was it illegal for a white person to be kind to an African American during segregation? Ah, okay, so so that's a that's a good question. The question is, was it illegal during segregation for a white person to be kind to a black person? And the answer is no. It was not illegal uh, to be kind. Now, um, there were some things that even if the, the white person wanted to be kind in a certain way they weren't allowed to do. For example, they couldn't say, well, would you like to come and sit with me and, and eat over here because uh, that's what segregation is. Many, many parts of the world of society, uh, restaurants and, and businesses and things like that were segregated. They have an area for whites and they have an area for blacks. So the nice white person couldn't say, would you like to come and have dinner with me? Because they couldn't go into that part. But there was nothing illegal about showing basic human dignity uh, and, and, you know, to, to another person. There, there wasn't anything like that. Now, they, that person might get um, poorly treated by, the, the white person may be poorly treated by other white people who didn't think that there should be that much interaction or that much kindness. Um, but, but no, it certainly wasn't illegal by any stretch of the imagination. And I, and I also like to think, we, we read so much about how, um, you know, how poorly African Americans were treated during segregation, and they were. Uh, but, you know, there were also, there are also really great stories about people who did work together and, and did their best to work in harmony given the times that they lived in. And I think that's one of the most important parts about history is to always try to find the good and the humanity in our ancestors as well as look at the bad because you have to get the full picture. So you have to be able to look with an open mind and see how things actually are and not go into it with a preconceived set of notions. I know that's a big word, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, um, it's a hard question to answer right now because it seems so foreign. I hope it seems foreign to us that we would uh, go to jail for trying to treat someone kindly. Hopefully we're past that. Uh, Michael wants to know, were, uh, was General Andre and Peggy Shippen, uh, were they friends? <laughs> maybe you want to explain who they yeah, are. So yeah, some, so someone asked, was uh, Major Andre and Peggy Shippen friends? Uh, during the American Revolution, they, they were. So Major Andre was a British officer, and among other duties, he was in charge of some of the espionage uh, and the spy work for the British Army uh, in, the, in the Northeast around the time of, you know, um, the Continental Army and uh, Boston and Philadelphia and things like that. And Peggy Shippen was an acquaintance of his. We, we know that they had met. Uh, we knew that they were friends. Peggy Shippen ends up, if I remember correctly, Peggy Shippen ends up marrying Benedict Arnold, who some of you may have heard of as the traitor to the American cause and the spy who intended to betray uh, George Washington's army at West Point to the British. And so it's a really, it's, it's, it's too much to get into now, but there's, it's, a, it's a spy story is what it is. And you get the feeling from, from trying to understand the story that Peggy Shippen 
is torn in how she feels about these things. I think she did, um, her, her family was very prominent. Her dad was a very wealthy uh, Philadelphia businessman. And so she's torn in her loyalties to, to the king and to her Native America, but she's also torn in how to deal with these people. Of course, Benedict Arnold at the beginning of the war was a fantastically brave American hero. And there's no question about that. But as time goes by, he starts to change the way he sees what loyalty is and who he's going to be loyal to. So Major Andre, of course, eventually is captured as a spy and he eventually is hanged uh, for being a spy because he was captured not in his British uniform but in regular clothes. And in the laws of the war at the time, that means that if he's caught being a spy not in a uniform, that he can be hanged without any sort of trial or anything like that. Sophia, who is 11, loves learning about the Tudors, uh, and that she just wants to know any information. <laughs> oh, Sophia, so you're interested in the Tudors. They are a great example of how someone wanted to make a really, really complicated, interesting, dark soap opera. They certainly don't need to write fiction. All they have to do is pick up some history and start transcribing it into a narrative. So the, the Tudor dynasty in England, in uh medieval, late medieval, you could say early Renaissance England, consists of Henry VII, who took the throne in a battle from someone who many people didn't think was supposed to have the throne anyway, Richard III. Um, and he felt bad that he had to kill someone to get the throne, to get the crown. And that troubled him his whole, uh, his whole the rest of his life as he was king of England. And then he has a son who we all know is Henry VIII. Um, Henry VIII was actually never supposed to be king. His older brother was supposed to be king. Uh, believe it or not, his name would have been King Arthur, but he died. Uh, uh, Arthur died before his dad, and so when Henry VII died, Henry VIII becomes king. And Henry VIII has a lot of wives because there's these things going around with who's in control of the church in England. He needs money. He's trying to find uh, a way that he can have a son who can go on and be king after him, but he's having trouble with his wives, and so he keeps getting new wives, hoping that they will give him a son who will be king. He was absolutely obsessed with the idea of succession in the throne. So he goes, one of those uh, children that he has, who's not his son, is Elizabeth, who is his second daughter. And as it turns out, Elizabeth becomes sovereign queen upon the death of her older sister Mary. So Henry VIII did have a son, Edward VII, I believe. And uh, when Henry dies, he thinks the crown is secure. Edward VII gets sick and dies as a young boy. Then his sister, Mary, becomes queen. And then Mary gets sick and dies. And then Elizabeth becomes queen. And then Elizabeth goes through and she's considered one of the great golden ages of British history. She uh, well, she doesn't personally do it, but her, her people defeat the Spanish Armada. Um, they uh, go from having the, the country almost broke to the country becoming very wealthy. Uh, this flowering of language and literature, this is the time of Shakespeare, right? Shakespeare begins writing in Elizabethan England, all the great play, or a lot of the great plays. But the problem is Elizabeth also does not have an heir. She never marries so she never has a son or a daughter, for that matter, who can be uh, the person who takes over the crown after her. So the crown actually ends up going to a Scottish part of the family. Uh, so there ends the Tudor line. It only lasted uh, for a little bit, but it gives us one of the most remarkable, one of the most turbulent, one of the most colorful parts of English history, as well as that golden age of Elizabethan England. Oh my goodness. The question is, were Theodore Roosevelt and Howard Taft... William Taft. I'm sorry, where did I get Howard? William Taft, you considered a eugenicist. So the eugenicists basically think that people need to be bred. Uh, people need to marry other people. It's going to lead to creating better people genetically. And the thought being, if you create better, better people genetically, then you're going to create smarter, faster, prettier... Uh, basically a superior race. I don't know that they, they probably did. I mean, 
I, I can't speak for Taft. Uh, I don't know that much about Taft, but I do know that Theodore definitely believed in the superiority of Americans. He definitely believed in the superiority of Americans for a lot of different reasons, but mostly because of where they lived and their history. And I think he saw that the improvement of humans was going to depend upon the continued growth of the very specifically American perspective on things. And of course, the way that America's perspective and America's power is going to grow is for Americans to continue to have, have children, to have babies and expand that out. Uh, I can't get into the specific details if they were eugenicists or not, because that is, that is not quite uh, something that I've looked into, but, but Theodore, it would not surprise me. Ah, the question is, who was the first ruler of England? Uh, that's, that's a tricky one. We, we don't know. As I said before, when England eventually began to be settled and after the water came up and separated from the mainland, the Neolithic tribes developed and then those tribes went into the Bronze Age and then the Bronze went into the Iron Age and and basically small kingdoms and tribes began to establish themselves all over England. And it was very, very hard for them to unify under one force. I don't think that there was a single unified ruler of Britain until the Anglo-Saxon days. Um, well, I say Britain, England. Uh, the Romans, the Roman Empire, when it, when it came, consolidated a lot of England economically and politically but there wasn't necessarily a ruler in England. There wasn't a king of England. They were still subject to the Republic and to the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire left, a lot of people divided back up into uh, these, these small kingdoms and these small tribes. But when you get to the Anglo-Saxon period, one of the things that lots of people were striving for was to become king of all the English uh, because there were Saxons, I mean, you look at the different parts of England. There's Sussex, the South Saxons, Wessex, the West Saxons, uh, Mercians, um, Northumbrians, and, they, and the kingdoms do get bigger, but they don't totally unify. Uh, you know, right around the time of Alfred the Great, uh, who finally becomes, as he labels himself, king of all the English, and that was a big deal for him to put that in his writ. So probably if you had to... Uh, force me to, to make a stand on that, I would probably say Alfred um, of, of, of Wessex did finally, with a lot of uh, political maneuvering, a couple of winning of battles and things like that, became king of all the English. Uh, Brittany, who is 11, wants to know, when did women's suffrage begin? Oh, so the question is, when did women's suffrage begin? Um, that's a good question. In the United States, you could argue that it sort of had a proto-beginning with, with that letter of Abigail who wanted, uh, who wanted John to remember the ladies in their developments of the American system, the American political system uh, in Philadelphia during the Revolution. But beyond that, women's suffrage movement, of course there are always women who see the need to have a voice in their, in their government, especially in a system like America, like the United States, where it's supposed to be uh, a single voice, a single vote, and a widespread enfranchisement. And before the American Civil War, there were a lot of forces at play that sort of joined together. Um, abolitionists who wanted slavery to end and for all slaves to be freed joined with women's suffrage movement because the thought was that if we're going to have truly equal rights, if we're going to realize the words written in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, then that has to expand just beyond white males. It has to expand just beyond males. It has to include all citizens of a country. And so there were women suffragists who were joined together with the abolitionist movement before the Civil War. The Civil War happens. And after the Civil War, you get the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendments, which basically establish that everyone, every adult in the United States is a citizen, but only the men can vote. This upset the women who had worked so hard for abolition for the cause of equality for everyone. 
that they basically got very frustrated and said the only thing we're going to work on right now is women's suffrage. Forget abolition, forget equal rights, we're going to focus on the vote for women. And of course it took until 1920 uh, for the 19th, 19th Amendment to finally take place and guarantee the vote for all women everywhere. Idea of the White House and how long did it take to build? Ah, uh, so the question is who came up with the idea of the White House and how long did it take to build? So when, uh, when we had established our republic after the American Revolution, we wanted to create a capital city literally from nothing. This was, if, if we're going to create this new nation from the earth, it sort of with nothing to base it on. They wanted a capital that reflected that spirit of something new that had never been seen under the sun. So George Washington primarily picks a spot on the Potomac River that actually is kind of swampy. It's not the best place to build in, but nevertheless, they begin to build there. And they know that they're going to need to be some very specific structures for the government. First and foremost, they're going to have to have uh, a capital where the legislature meets, where the House of Representatives and Senate will meet, the capital. They're going to have to have a place for the American archives, for our knowledge and our records and our patents and things like that. But we're also going to have to have a place for this new idea of a president to be. And so they call it the, the president's mansion. It's not called the White House in the very beginning. It's the president's mansion. And comparatively, it is a, it is a vast structure that's being built there in Washington City. Because again, it wasn't thought of that this place would be just where the president lived, this was going to house everything the president needed, uh, where he would live, where he would work, where the people who helped him would work, where he would receive foreign diplomats and things like that. It was sort of going to sort of be a, a main building of business, not just where he lives. And uh, it was called the president's mansion, so Washington never got to live there. Uh, John Adams, when he is elected president, gets to go there, and it is only about half built and they, they don't complete it by the time uh, of the end of his presidency in 1800. But then uh, Thomas Jefferson comes in, and, and it's more or less complete, and he begins to decorate it and get furniture and make it a very, very nice place. His successor, James Madison, comes in, and of course the War of 1812 happens, and the British come, and they burn it down. Uh, and then they have to rebuild the Capitol. They have to rebuild the White House. And one of the things they sort of do is they decide to just paint the entire outside white. That, at that point, is when it came to be known as the White House. And as a result of that name sticking, that's just what we've called it ever since. All right. So we have a question about the German boat Bismarck. Did it sink because the crew destroyed their own ship? Uh, the question is, did the... Did the German battleship Bismarck sink because the crew destroyed the ship. Uh, wow, I could just, how long do I have left? Uh, quick in a nutshell, so World War II happens and the Germans are trying to build the Navy. They build what is probably at the time the most advanced battleship, the Bismarck. It's not just that it's big and has big guns, but it's very technologically advanced. It has the ability to aim the guns at very long distances. The, it, you know, being able to shoot far doesn't mean anything if you can't hit your target. But the Bismarck has very, very effective fire control, and if it gets out into the Atlantic, it could devastate the lifeline between England and all the places where it's getting supplies in 1940. So the British Navy becomes obsessed with sinking the Bismarck, and the Bismarck finally does get out into the ocean the entire British Navy just goes all over it, and they begin to attack it. And the Bismarck destroys two British battleships in about an eight to ten minute battle. It's that effective. So it freaks everyone out, and they continue to send more on it. So it's trying to get, it gets a little bit of damage, and it's trying to get back to the coast of France so that it can be repaired. And out of the sky, a lonely biplane, right? An old fashioned plane drops a torpedo and hits the Bismarck in a lucky spot on the rudder. And it blocks the rudder so that the Bismarck at that point can only go in circles. It's trapped. The British Navy comes and begins to fire at the Bismarck and just continues to shoot it and shoot it and shoot it. Uh, Germany and Hitler had declared and bragged that the Bismarck was unsinkable, which is where the real root of the question comes. 
Did the enemy fire actually sink the Bismarck, or did the Bismarck, did the, did the sailors on it actually force it to sink? Um, there's a couple of different lines of thought on that, but based on uh, the interviews with the survivors from the Bismarck, it does seem like the British fire from the Navy didn't sink it. Now, it was, it was little more than a floating steel hulk by the time all the British shells had hit it and exploded, but it wasn't sinking. But to keep it from falling into British hands, the, the sailors did go down into the hull of the ship and they opened the, sh- the, 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 the cocks. That's the, every ship has holes in the bottom in case it needs to sink or take on water. And they opened them up, they let the seawater come in, and it did eventually sink. Uh, based on a couple of veteran interviews that were actually on the Bismarck, that's what they said they did, and I personally have no reason to disbelieve it because it was a phenomenal engineering marvel uh, of its age. All right. Um, how many soldiers were killed in the American Revolution? Oh, you know, that's, that's a question I don't know the, off the top of my head. The question is how many people, how many soldiers were killed in the American Revolution? I don't know the exact number. Um, compared to some of the, the losses we suffered in World War I or World War II, uh, or especially the Civil War, it probably doesn't seem like a lot. Libby, did you? Yeah, did you? it uh, seems like 6,800 Americans were killed. Okay, so, so about 6,800 Americans uh, were, were killed in the American Revolution. Now, that doesn't include, you know, people who might have uh, been hit in the arm and they had to have their, their arm amputated or things like that. That's not wounded. That's just outright killed. I would also bet that that number does not include people who died of disease. Um, I don't think that, that's killed in action. Yeah, that's killed in action. So there's probably at least two, maybe three times that number. That's exactly right. It says historians believe that at least an additional 17,000 deaths Yeah, so the estimate is 17,000 deaths due to disease. And again, this is is something when you're looking at casualties uh, over the course of an entire war throughout history, um, there are, there's killed in action and then there's wounded. There's casualties includes wounded and killed, okay? Uh, And usually you have about twice as many wounded as you do killed. And throughout the course of a war, you usually have two to three times as many people die from disease as are uh, killed in battle until until World War II. That's the first war where this doesn't happen because by World War II, we have developed antibiotics that can fight infection. So World War II is actually the first war in history where more people were killed in combat than died of disease. Every single war before that, more people died from disease than died from combat wounds. Okay, our last question is, can you tell us about some presidents that are not as well known by the general public? Oh yeah, so, so for our last question, someone asked if I could share some thoughts on presidents that are not as well known by the general public. Um, gosh, it's, it's sort of hard for a historian to answer because you, you kind of think about all of them. Um, Herbert Hoover? <laughs> uh, you know, he was, he was president before Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, he, um, before he was president, built Hoover Dam. And he's very much blamed for the Depression because he didn't do anything about it. Uh, he didn't want the government to interfere. And, and he's gotten a bad rap because he was actually an incredibly intelligent man. He was a fantastic engineer and administrator and organizer. But as it turns out, when he gets into office, he's not that inspirational of a leader. And then the depression happens, which is outside of his ability to, to control. And it's certainly outside his ability to stop. So he sort of goes in and goes into oblivion. And we all think of, of FDR. Um, gosh. Some other ones. We, yeah. we have a list of top 10 forgettable presidents. Yeah, top 10. What, who the, There's uh, Martin Van Buren, John uh, Tyler, Millard Fillmore. Oh, Kennedy. yeah, Martin Van Buren. So, so that's interesting too. So you know, Andrew Jackson, everyone knows Andrew Jackson. He's on the 20. He fought at the Battle of New Orleans. And of course, he's the one who removed all the Indians. Well, um, Jackson himself obviously never physically removed any Indian. He had other people that could do that for him. But the policies that went into place for that, a uh, a lot of them 
happened after Jackson left office, and they happened under the administration of Martin Van Buren, who uh, had a big head of hair and incredible mutton chops, but other than that, most people don't even know anything about him. <laughs> All right, so I think we'll end there. Is that it? Okay, yeah, so it's 3 o'clock, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. I've had a great time today. Uh, I love answering questions. I, I love to see the different variety that you come up with. I love for you to to test me and let me see if I can actually uh, answer, see, see how many of these I can actually answer. So, uh, like I said, we've got a great week. Uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern, we're going to just sort of uh, start a discussion and have a, a presentation about not just the Civil War, but the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction. We've gotten a lot of requests for this. Uh, I think this is a, something that's being covered in schools right now, uh, both public school and, and maybe even in college. But I also think it's important to look at, you can't just stop with the Civil War and say the war is over and not look at the results. And that's what Reconstruction is. That is an incredibly important part of that entire era and a lot of where we're at today. So that's tomorrow at 2. Thank you for joining us. If you can uh, give us any financial support in any way, please feel free to go to our website and click that donate button. But you don't have to. What I will ask that each and every one of you do is tell your friends, tell your family about these live streams because we want to reach as many people as possible with some of this great information. And we want all of you to take care. So in the meantime, until tomorrow, we'll see you.